we're up to mitzvah number 73, and today we're going to do two mitzvahs that are related, mitzvah number 73 and mitzvah number 471, and this relates to the laws of kosher. In fact, last week's parasha, we read about the kosher animals, which animals are kosher, which animals are non-kosher, but even once you have a kosher animal, you have to process it in a way that renders it kosher. You have to slaughter it, for example. You have to inspect it. And the reason why you have to inspect it is because of mitzvah number 73 and, to a lesser extent, mitzvah number 471. And that's because the Torah says that not every bovine is kosher. Even though the Torah says, well, if it has split hooves and it rechews its cut, it's a kosher animal. However, in the event that it is a nevela or a trefa, those are the words, nevela and trefa, which means a carcass or a ripped or torn animal, it would not be kosher. Any animal that has a fatal injury, and it doesn't matter if it was born like that, it was born defective, it was injured by another animal, it got some sort of illness or disease or malady or lesion or cancer or some other form of injury that rendered it ill to the degree that it's, a, it's suffering or it's, it's, it's subjected to a, a fatal disease, that would be forbidden to eat even if it is slaughtered properly. So you have a kosher animal, it's a cow, you slaughter it in the kosher fashion, you make sure the knife is perfectly smooth and you have a highly trained, highly skilled shochet who slaughters it, and then they open up the animal and they see that it's got punctured lungs that animal would be not kosher, send it to the non-kosher pile because it is a trefa. A nevela is an animal that died on its own. It died without proper slaughtering. And that too, despite the fact that it is a kosher breed, it's a bovine, it's a sheep, it's a lamb, it's a goat. It's one of the animals that qualifies, but it has to be killed in the proper way. And that's, there's two mitzvahs related to that, the mitzvah of slaughtering and the mitzvah to not consume a nevela, an animal that died without being slaughtered. So these are the two mitzvahs. Mitzvah 73, to not eat a trefa, an animal that was ripped or torn, and mitzvah number 472, sorry, I said earlier 471, 472, which is to not eat a nevela, a carcass, an animal that died without proper slaughtering. So the Torah tells us in chapter 22 of Exodus that if you find a, a flesh or, or meat in the field that was ripped or torn, that you should not eat. Instead, you should throw it to the dogs. I eat, it's not kosher for human consumption or for, for Jew consumption, but it can be given to the animal, i.e. you could benefit from it. You could give it to your pet, but you cannot consume it. And the Talmud explains, what does that mean? It means any animal that has a fatal injury, if it was mauled by another animal, or even if it has any other injury that would render it ill to the degree that it's likely to die, or it's bound to die as a result of this illness, that would render it a trefa, and it would be non-kosher. Well, everyone's going to die. Every animal's going to die. So don't we all have fatal injuries? illnesses to begin with because no one's made it to 500 years in a long time and certainly not animals so what is the time frame that uh is needed so to speak to render an animal a trefa so the Talmud tells us in the book of Chulin, page 57b that it refers specifically to an illness that will kill the animal within a year so if an animal has an illness, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, again, if it falls off a building or if it's trampled or if it was shot and, uh, the, and the, uh, the arrow punctured its heart or its ribs were broken or its lungs were punctured. It does not matter. It is now a trefa and it is not kosher. In fact, the, the common word for, a non, for non-kosher food is, is treif. And that comes from this word, trefa, referring to an animal that is ill, that is injured, to the degree that it will die within a year. Now, the Sefer HaChinuch, the book that we are using to navigate through the 613 mitzvos, he always tries to give a little rationalization, a little explanation to understand the reason behind the mitzvos. And we always reiterate this point. 
and he himself says it, that this is not the sole reason why, this is not the Almighty's reason why. It's just, it's helpful for us to gain a little bit of an understanding for ourselves, just to kind of sweeten the whole notion of mitzvah, to say that it's not just, oh, the will of God, and it doesn't make any sense to us. We could try, and we're even encouraged to try, to make the mitzvah a little bit more understandable and to see how we ourselves benefit from it as well. So every mitzvah, he tries to give a rationalization, an explanation, some underlying reason that will make our observance of that particular mitzvah a little bit more uh, understandable. So why is it bad to eat meat? To eat beef? Beef is what's, what's for dinner. It's healthy. It's full of protein. What's wrong? If it was killed this way, if it was killed that way, if it has a little illness, so what? It's got a punctured lung. Don't eat the lung. Why can't you have the shoulder or uh, the, the, the ribs? Don't eat the lungs. What's the problem? It's a very good question. So the Chinuch, he, he has the following explanation. He says that the Torah is telling us that All the things that are not kosher are actually bad for your health. It's bad for your health. And the health of your body is very important because the body is the cradle for the soul. And you can have a soul that's just bursting with inspiration and energy and it wants to do mitzvahs and wants to fill the Almighty's will and wants to study Torah. That's the will of the soul. But the soul on its own is powerless. It's like a bird flapping in the air. It has to be anchored in a body. But if the body is weak, if the body is brittle, if the body is not strong and sturdy and robust, well, then the soul cannot actualize and implement its agenda. And therefore, it's imperative that we do whatever we can to make sure that our body is strong as well, because the body is needed for the soul. And therefore, the Almighty gave us all the laws of kosher and all the various different components of that and which animals we should eat and which animals we should avoid. And even when we have a kosher animal, we should know there's some versions of the cow, the bovine, the sheep, the goat, etc. that actually are not sturdy. And when we imbibe and we absorb those animals, it weakens our body. It introduces harmful toxins into our body. That will make our body weaker. And consequently, the will of our soul cannot be as easily or successfully implemented with a weak body. And he compares it to tongues. You have tongues, the tools of the craftsman. A craftsman has tools. But if the tools are bad tools, well, then the vessels that the tools are going to be used to make, those vessels are going to be flawed. So our soul is like the master craftsman. But even a master craftsman has to have a good set of tools. And the set of tools the soul uses, well, that's the body. And you feed the body bad food, the body absorbs those toxins or those unhealthy things. And now the tools, the tongs, the implements of the soul are weak. And the result of that, the mitzvahs that we do, the Torah study that we do, the agenda of our soul is going to be compromised. And then he tells us that only a fool could say, I know exactly all the interactions of all the different kinds of foods. And I know that, oh, maybe in antiquity, they used to think that you eat the pig and it's not healthy, or you eat a weak animal or a frail animal, or an injured animal, or a mauled animal. It's not healthy, but today we could use with science, of course. We could use the new methods to figure out what's actually healthy and what is not healthy. And he says, you have to be a fool to believe that. And again, this is the Sefer Chenuch writing this 700 years ago. You would be a fool to think that you can actually assimilate all the data and come to the bottom line. We have God, creator of heaven and earth, who knows everything, and he gives us the bottom line and we should rely on it. And then he adds, the Torah does not reveal to us the harmful nature of the foods that it prohibits. And the reason is, because if the Torah would say, well, this animal is bad for your health 
because of this and this reason, some clever person will say, well, that's actually not always true. Because under this and this circumstances, you're anemic, you have vitamin D deficiency. Well, in your particular case, it's actually healthy. Oh, and the Torah, because it was given to the Jewish people in the desert, and in the desert, they have too much of this and not enough of that. And that's the reason why they said it. But now we're living in the frozen tundra or we're living in the tropics. Well, now it's actually healthy. And therefore, says the Sefer Chinuch, if the Torah gives us too much information, it makes our life unmanageable and it makes the laws of the Torah uh, ungovernable. And therefore, the Almighty does not reveal to us that uh, the reasons the reasons why the things that he prohibits are bad for us, but we should rely on him, they are bad for us. And then he explains that when an animal gets injured, it affects the whole animal, and it becomes influenced, so to speak, it influences the health quality, the nutritional quality of that particular flesh. And of course, we know this today. We know you are what you eat, and we know that organic is better, and grass-fed beef is healthier, and we know that the environment that an animal is in will actually affect the nutritional quality of the particular meat that it produces. But in antiquity, that was a very novel idea. And certainly, you know, if I was coming to someone 3,000 years ago and saying, well, this cow is good for you, and this identical looking cow is terrible for you, they would laugh at us. But today we know that there is indeed truth for this. Okay, so that's the general idea of, of kosher according to the Sefer Chinuch. Kosher and all the kosher laws and the kinds of animals and everything that happens to the animals, the, the trefa and the nevela, those are there to facilitate good health. Now, I want to stress, and this is something we do often, the amount of material related to these particular laws is vast and voluminous. And people spend lots of time studying the intricacies of what would render an animal a trefa. But we're going to give just a little snapshot. So the snapshot goes as follows. The Talmud tells us that there are eight different categories of animals of illnesses and injuries that would render an animal into a trefa. And these are general categories, and each category has subcategories within it. And the Talmud calculates that there are 72 different illnesses or injuries or maladies or conditions that would render an animal unkosher under the laws of a trefa. So number one, if the animal is clawed, so it's a type of another animal, it's clawed, that would render it into a trefa, even if no internal organ was punctured or damaged. If an animal was punctured, number two, which means one of the vital organs has a hole through it, has a hole in the heart, in the intestines, in the lungs, in the brain, in the esophagus, etc., that renders the animal into traf, it is non-kosher even if you kill it, you slaughter it in proper fashion. If the animal is deficient, it's missing an organ. If an organ was removed, if part of the animal was severed, if the animal was torn, if there's a tear, if there's a tear in the abdominal wall, if the animal falls from a great height, and finally, if the animal has broken bones, it is fractured, it would become a trefa. And these general categories, there's different laws pertaining uh, to the question of what to do in the event of uncertainty. I don't know. Did it fall? Did it not fall? Was it clawed? Was it not clawed? Whenever there's doubt, the question is, well, well okay, is it in category one, two, three, or category eight? And each one of these categories has different rules that govern it. And each one, like we said earlier, has subcategories and the total amount of injuries that would render an animal to a trefa is 72. And the Sefer Chinuch tells us, and the Sefer Chinuch tells us that these are fixed. You cannot 
add anymore. You can't say, well, today, based upon modern medical research, we know to add this injury. And you cannot subtract one from this fixed and immutable total. You can't say, well, today we know that this is not so bad. We have to follow these rules. So, okay, we have an animal. It looks perfectly healthy from the outside. And we slaughter it. What do we need to do to make sure that this meat that comes from this cow is kosher? There are a multitude of conditions that would render into a trefa. And we can't tell from the naked eye looking at the animals from the outside. We can't tell. It doesn't look like it has any punctures. But how do we know? Must we remove every organ and examine it? And look internally, maybe it has some lesions or some cancers or some holes in its heart. How would you know? So here's where it gets interesting. The Talmud tells us that we assume, again, knowing nothing else, there's an assumption of health. It's innocent, it's kosher, until proven unkosher, with the exception of one, and that is with the lungs. When you slaughter an animal, the one organ you must inspect in order to render the entirety of that animal, 1,500 pounds of meat, to render that kosher, that you have to inspect the lungs. And thus, we have to take out the lungs. I actually looked on YouTube to find a video of it. I couldn't find anything when I typed in in English, but I did find one in Hebrew. And it's really interesting how you have an expert who's showing you the lungs. It's a little bit hard for me to watch. I get a little queasy around these stuff. But he's taking and showing you, the, well, there's this lobe and that lobe. And there's, 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 there's three lobes on this side and only two on that side because the heart is there. And he's showing you, and, and they're all named by the Talmud. And the Talmud describes with perfect accuracy, with perfect accuracy the exact anatomy of the cow and its internal organs, you have to inspect it to make sure that it is smooth. It has no holes in it or no lesions in it. And what is the Yiddish name for smooth? The Yiddish name for smooth is glat, smooth. And the Hebrew name is chalak, which means smooth. And these terms are very important terms in the laws of kosher, because if it's glot kosher, it means that after you slaughter the animal in a kosher fashion, you took out the lungs and you, and you looked at every part of the lungs and it was completely smooth, it was completely glot, it was completely chalak, as they say in Hebrew. That renders it glot kosher. If it has a certain lesion or a certain injury that's kind of iffy, it may be in the kosher pile, but not the glot kosher pile. Now, I did read online, I found the official OU, the Orthodox Union, the largest kosher, kosher uh, company in the world. I did find they had a description of what they do with the animal and read it to you here. The next stage in the production of the beef is the bedikas harea, the examination of the lungs. This takes place in two stages. The first is called bidikas pinim, internal examination. The bodek, which means the inspector. There are people who, whose expertise is to inspect the lungs of cows after they were slaughtered. The bodek places his hands inside the chest cavity and gently feels his way around each of the eight lobes for any adhesions or abnormal tissue. If the lung is really free of lesions, it is, quote, glot kosher. If a small lesion is found, the bodek will carefully tear at it and identify its location and then would reveal the location to the bodek chutz, which is the external examiner, who receives it after its complete removal from the animal. So then you have the external examiner who re-examines the lung for discoloration and a host of other possible trefas, passes his hands and eyes carefully over the entire lung, 
He will take the remains of the adhesions reported to him by the voter Pnim and attempt to peel them carefully from the lawn. This is not a job for, for most people, I think. You have to be really tough to do it. Certainly not for me, even reading this makes me a little queasy. He then inflates the lung, and this I saw in the video also, you kind of, there's like a little pipe, like a balloon. You, you blow into it, and you see the, the part of the lungs inflate. That's what, that's what lungs do, right? They absorb the oxygen in the air, and, and they get bigger, like the diaphragm expands. He then inflates the lung or section thereof at the point where the peeling was done and passes it through water to see if any air bubbles escape. It's like uh, trying to figure out if you plug your tire correctly. In which case, the animal is pronounced trefa. The same procedure is followed for adhesions between the adjoining lobes. If this phase of is successful, the animal is pronounced kosher, but not glot, and labeled accordingly. So if, an, if it's called glot kosher, it means it's completely, the lungs specifically, which we don't have the assumption that it is healthy, unless we know otherwise. The lungs, we don't have that assumption if we have to inspect every lungs. So if it's completely clear and clean, it's glot kosher. And if it's clean, but, 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 maybe there's a problem, it's not perfectly clean, well, then it'll be just kosher and not glot. And this, by the way, shows us the importance of relying on reputable organizations because the consumer has no idea when you buy it off the shelf, you have no idea what was done to this animal. And what if they found the puncher? If they found the puncher, it is not kosher. It's like eating pig. But it's identical. There's no way for you to tell, at least. So you have to rely on, you have to outsource this to third parties who have, who have the credibility and the reputation and the trust and the expertise to actually do this in a proper way because, again, the consumer is totally ignorant once it arrives at them. So if we have the animal covered in lesions or cancer or like that, go straight to the non-kosher pile. If it's totally smooth, it's glot kosher, and then we have all this whole mid-range where it is kosher, it doesn't have any punctures, but it's not glot. It's not perfectly smooth. The animal maybe has some condition, it's not a trefa, but it's not glot kosher. I did hear from one of the kosher people that only around 30% of the animals slaughtered in a kosher slaughterhouse end up in the, I don't remember if he said glot or kosher pile, but a huge percentage of animals are not rigorous, robust, healthy enough to pass the test, and they end up going to the non-Jews to eat the non-kosher. Now, the other mitzvah that we talked about, mitzvah number 472, is a little bit simpler, and that states quite simply that if you find an animal dead, and it's not killed, then it would be called nivela, and it has to uh, be discarded. It cannot be consumed, or you can give it to the dog. And this, by the way, would apply also to the event where the shechita, the slaughtering, was faulty. That, too, would render it into a nivela. It would be not kosher. And again, the laws of slaughtering are its own mitzvah. We'll get to it. Uh, it's in the book of, of Deuteronomy. Now, this is obviously a very important subject to talk about because, you know, we eat multiple times a day on most days. And as Jews and people who are observing Torah, the Almighty's governance, so to speak, is pervasive through our lives and uh, especially in the area of kosher. And here the San Francisco tells us a very rational idea that if an animal is unhealthy, it makes us unhealthy. And if we're unhealthy physically, well, then we will be compromised spiritually. So that's the reason that he gives. But the truth is that there are many other reasons given by the commentators. So, for example, the Ramban, he has a totally different approach. He says that there's something spiritually harmful about eating non-kosher. Now, of course, that's harder for us to understand. What does that mean? Why? would the animal affect us negatively, spiritually? But he says, this idea, you are what you eat, and if you eat certain things, you imbibe its characteristics, and the characteristics of non kosher food is that it impacts you negatively, deleteriously, spiritually. And even adds that if you look at the list of 
non-kosher birds in the Torah, they're all birds of prey. And he tells us that if you consume these non-kosher birds, they are cruel birds, and you, by consuming them, will adopt the characteristics of cruelty of the animals that you eat. Uh, the way it's described in last week's parish of Shashmini, and the way the Talmud describes it, is that it makes your heart dull. It makes you less spiritually sensitive. It makes your capacity for nuance more diminished. And by the way, the, the Talmud stresses that this applies in an amplified fashion from the mom to her baby in utero. That if a woman consumes non kosher food while she's pregnant, that child will be born with uh, diminished spiritual capacities compared to what would have happened had that child only received filtered kosher food. And the Talmud gives a great story about Acher. Acher was one of the great sages of the Talmudic era, and he was the one sage in history that went awry, became a heretic. And everyone's trying to figure out, why did Acher go awry? He was the teacher of Rabbi Meir. He's one of the great sages. And he went off and became a heretic. And this is such a unique phenomenon that the Talmud spends a lot of time and effort trying to isolate where he went wrong. And the Talmud tells the famous story of the four sages who entered the Pardes, the four sages who started to experience the very high levels of, of the esoterica. And one of them was Acher, and it says that he got burned. And he became someone who was a heretic. But we're also told that his mother, when she was pregnant, she, you know, pregnant women are known to have, uh, uh, what's it called? To have um, cravings. Cravings. They want pickles. They want ice cream. They have these unusual cravings. They like to smell gasoline. And uh, Acher's mom, she has him in her uterus, and she passes by, an, and she passes by an idolatrous temple, and they were serving pork there. And anyone who wanted to come in was welcome. And she smelled the wafting aroma of pork, and she couldn't resist. So she walks in and has a helping. And the way it's described in the literature, the forbidden meat quivered within her, was coursing within her like venom from a venomous snake, and that actually penetrated her child, and it wasn't manifested for many years. But many years later, there was something already off within him from the very beginning, and that's why he went awry. So, yes, when you go to the store, and you look at two adjoining shelves in the freezer section, and they both contain chicken, or they both contain meat. And here it's like $1.99 per pound. And here it's like $14.99 per pound. Like the, 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 the numbers are so different, the discrepancy, and they look identical. And you're like, well, this is meat. This is prime Angus beef. And this is prime Angus beef. But this will set me back $4. And this will set me back $45. I think the, uh, the cost-benefit analysis that we would do is like, well, they're identical. I'll go for the cheaper version, save the money. But here we describe, but here, but here we discover that actually, no, what you're getting is a product that's probably less healthy for you. If you have a slaughterhouse and the animals covered in cancer and all kinds of other problems, you give it to the non kosher pile. And also, there's this idea that the Ramban and others talk about that it's going to affect you spiritually in a negative way. Why are these Jews so smart? Why are they so clever? Why are they so sharp? Why are they so good in business? Maybe, maybe it's because they eat kosher. And the kosher 
food is better for you. It's better for you intellectually. It's better for you spiritually. It's a little bit more expensive, but that's not a, a good enough reason for you to choose something which is so injurious and harmful to you. So that's the mitzvah, the two mitzvahs we're doing today, mitzvah number 73 and four and 472, the concept of kosher, galat kosher. It's only a snapshot of the mitzvah, of course, there's many, many details. If you want to become someone who is a bodek, who is an inspector, I assume you'll need at least six months of training, plus uh, tremendous fortitude to handle the environment of a slaughterhouse. But this is just a, a little overview, a little snapshot of what goes in to determining what meat is kosher, what makes it kosher, what makes it treif, what makes it an avela, what makes it glot kosher, the best. It's what's for dinner. Okay. So uh, let's uh, pause for questions, if there are any.